NRRA's Solid Waste Facility Operator Training Module, Act 148, Vermont's Universal Recycling Law, What Do I Need to Know? Welcome community educators and environmental ambassadors. The Northeast Resource Recovery Association, NRRA, is pleased to present today's training, which is made possible by a generous grant from the U.S. Department of Agriculture World Development with the following goals. Cross-train solid waste facility operators and school staff in rural communities of New Hampshire and Vermont. And because this is a webinar, you may not be in a rural community of New Hampshire and Vermont, but that was our focus area, our targeted audience during the grant year. Take down the wall between towns and schools. This means to increase participation in materials management programs that occur in schools and municipalities with the hope that everyone starts to work together. Economy of scale. Expand participation in NRRA's education programs through online learning. And thanks to the USDA Rural Utility Service, the program training is free. The goal of the program is for the trained participants to work together on creating a safer environment, knowledgeable staff on the proper storage and handling of hazardous materials, and working in conjunction on solid waste issues. After you view the webinar, please complete the webinar evaluation to help us understand your knowledge and the steps you want to take to assist your community with managing materials comprehensively. Once you submit the evaluation, you can download a certificate of completion for this webinar. The certificate of completion also gives you the chance to get credit for your um, education units, your CEUs, and also um, professional development credit if you are looking for that, if you're an operator of a transfer station or solid waste facility or an educator. You will receive the evaluation link for this webinar via email from info at nrra.net. Once you have completed and submitted your evaluation, you will have access to your completion certificate. If you have technical difficulties, please send an email to info at nrra.net. So just a little bit about us, for those who don't know us, we started in 1981. Uh, at that time, it was just four municipalities in New Hampshire, and they called themselves the New Hampshire Resource Recovery Association. Their purpose is to provide a clearinghouse for current up-to-date information and a source of technical and marketing assistance in the general areas of waste reduction and recycling. In 1995, the New Hampshire Resource Recovery Association amended when the organization expanded beyond just New Hampshire and included the surrounding neighboring states. So now our coverage area is Vermont, New Hampshire, Southern Maine, Northern Mass, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and any NRRA member town. That means that you do not have to necessarily live in the Northeast to receive um, our programs. You could be in Texas or Florida, Idaho, anywhere else in the United States and become a member of NRRA and you will receive our newsletters and um, any other modules that we create. You'd be a part of that. It'd be a long distance. Um, most likely we wouldn't be brokering the, your recyclables because that's what we do in the Northeast. We know we offer advice in the marketplace for the entire solid waste management stream. Everything from trash to construction and demolition debris to freon removal to recycling from single stream and contracts with your individual material vendors. We are your one-stop shop for all things recycling. We monitor both the international markets, paying attention to what's happening in the European community um, and also the impact it has here domestically in the United States. NRA's School Recycling Club assists schools in implementing, maintaining, and improving materials management programs. The club can give new or exciting school groups a chance to join a program that will help them promote or advance their efforts, network with other school groups, and stimulate school recycling, reducing waste, and conserving energy. A lot of the people that are not in the Northeast that are members of NRRA become members in order to take advantage of the NRRA school club. The club offers four classroom workshops and three school technical assistance programs. The workshops are designed for use in a standard classroom setting and most can be tailored to fit the curricular and developmental needs of any class grades K through 12. 
The technical assistance programs are designed to work at a larger school-wide level and focus on big picture problems and solutions. So if you have any um, questions or would like more information about NRRA's school club program, contact Gwen Early at G-E-R-L-E-Y at nrra.net. For the operators, Solid Waste Professionals, NRRA, currently hosts monthly operations and marketing meetings to its members. These meetings provide a wealth of information and training to those who are able to attend. Since these meetings are only held at the NRRA office in Epsom, New Hampshire, training and information dissemination is limited to those who are able to travel to the meetings to participate. But this is why we are doing more online trainings, expanding our speaker engagements at conferences, and in increasing our on-site technical assistance visits. We also have um, our annual conference in the month of May. And this conference is a two-day conference uh, held in Manchester, New Hampshire. It's a conference and expo. Uh, the first day is uh, all for the solid waste professionals. And the second day includes schools and educators. So um, the two days of training targeted towards um, professionals in the solid waste field and, the, and municipal decision makers, um, uh, recycling coordinators, anybody who works with the materials management program. But on the second day, we add students and teachers to the mix and have a whole bunch of workshops geared towards um, just teachers and students and what is going on with school recycling. It's a very exciting day, especially that second day when the professionals in the solid waste field and those that are um, in the expo, the vendors all combine with the students and teachers. So. Uh, we assist with the continuing professional development education credits, like I said, by providing additional training opportunities, including the monthly mom meeting, the annual conference, and then fall bus tours, um, as well as presentations that we will do at locations that are more convenient for the operators. So watching this webinar, you can get your professional development education, coming to the monthly mom meetings, the annual conference, joining us on our fall bus tour, or inviting us to your location to do on-site training. We'll all earn professional development credits. And then again, just thanks to the USDA funding, because the operator training modules that we usually bring to you are now going to be available on our website, nrra.net. Now let us begin our discussion about Act 148, Vermont's Universal Recycling Law. What do I need to know? This training module outlines the concepts of Vermont's Universal Recycling Law. Vermont's Act 148 specifies a number of key changes to solid waste management in Vermont designed to increase diversion of materials and organics from landfill disposal. Since its inception, it has been a work in progress with built-in flexibility. The Universal Recycling Law was written with the understanding that one size does not fit all. Haulers can request an exemption from collecting recyclables, leaf and yard debris, and food scraps by working with the Solid Waste Management District, Alliance, or Town to apply for an amendment to the Solid Waste Management Plan, or SWIP. Facilities are also eligible for variances from the requirements to offer collection of leaf and yard debris and food scraps. Businesses and other producers of food waste are permitted to dispose of a de minimis amount of food waste if they have an active composting program in place where staff have received instruction on separating food waste from the trash. And finally, residents who compost at home are not required to compost meat and bones, which can be disposed of in the trash. So, in 2012, the Vermont Legislator unanimously passed the Universal Recycling Law, which is Act 148, and it bans, in phases, the disposal of three major types of waste materials commonly found in Vermonters' trash bins. The blue bin, recyclables, were banned by July 2015, leaf and yard debris, clean wood, by July 2016, 
and food scraps, which is the organic compostable kitchen waste by July 2020. And so that's now why it makes sense that the state realized that it is um, needed a little flexibility, that one size does not fit all, and there are some variances with permission from the state. These waste materials are now being recognized as recoverable resources that should not congest the shrinking landfill space. So when Act 148 first uh, came out, the, what they did was they decided to change the term solid waste planning to now materials management plan. And um, it required that all of the Vermont's waste districts, alliances, independent towns, and all other solid waste management entities to uh, rewrite the SWIPs, and that was a solid waste, man solid waste implementation plan, and all the SWIPs needed to be approved by ANR by June 18th, 2016. And this provided the state with the opportunity to sort of catch up and see what everybody was doing in, um, in Vermont, and so again, that they could be able to uh, help with a transition that the Act 148 was asking. Why did uh, Act 148 get put into place? Basically because the waste diversion rates had stagnated in Vermont um, between 30 to 36 percent over the past 10 years. A significant portion of the waste stream that is disposed is composed of recyclable items, leaf and yard debris, and food scraps that could be diverted from landfills and put to better use. In addition, the landfilling these materials, especially the food scraps, contributes to climate change by producing greenhouse gas emissions. And so the recyclable materials, food scraps, and leaf and yard debris are all valuable resources that should not be thrown away. And finally, landfill space in Vermont is limited to uh, the, is limited in the major landfills uh, is nearing its capacity. So there's one major landfill, and that's up in Coventry, Vermont, up by the Canadian border. As much as 50% of Vermont's trash includes recyclables or compostable materials like food scraps and leaf and yard debris. With concern over wasting valuable natural resources and the impact of this waste on global climate change, the stage was set to boost recycling and launch statewide composting. The goals of universal recycling are to decrease the amount of waste disposed and increase the state's recycling and composting rate through a phased-in timeline that started in 2012 and finishes in 2020. Recycling materials conserves resources while reducing energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. The law achieves this by providing more consistent and convenient services for recycling and composting services wherever trash is managed throughout the state. In addition, this legislation sends clear signals to both the private and public sector that recyclable and organic materials, food scraps, leaf and yard debris, will be available which incentivizes investment in recycling, food donation, animal feeding, composting, and anaerobic digestion businesses, infrastructure, and services. This, in effect, puts Vermont's waste to work as part of a circular economy that contributes to Vermont's environment and economy and green jobs rather than causing harm. The Agency of Natural Resources, Department of Environmental Conservation, is tasked with implementing the universal recycling. The state recognizes that this can be a large change for many Vermont businesses and residents and has focused on creating convenient, consistent, and cost-effective systems to help everyone reach statewide compliance. In order to do so, they have required curbside collection requirements for licensed haulers to offer collection services for recyclables by 2015, leaf and yard debris by 2016, and food scraps by 2017. 
with exemptions under certain conditions. And the state also required the adoption of pay-as-you-throw variable rate pricing for land from material to encourage diversion. And as I stated earlier, the law is a work in progress. In May 2018, a new rule put off a requirement to have solid waste haulers pick up food scraps from in front of the residential homes in 2018. So actually, as you can see on the timeline, and we'll go into this a little bit more detail um, as we talk about each sector, but in 2017, the haulers must offer food scrap collection. That actually was changed to July 1st, 2018. And then when 2018 came along, the um, trash haulers were supposed to offer this curbside pickup then, but a uh, bill, uh, the S-285, passed at the end of the legislative session and it put that requirement off for at least two years. And I'd just like to take a moment to play a clip from VPR regarding this change. Trash haulers will get a break from having to pick up compost in 2018 under a bill that passed in the final hours of the legislative session. But the sponsor of the bill says lawmakers only kicked the can down the road without addressing the real problem in Vermont's solid waste and recycling law. VPR's Howard Wise Tisman has more. When the legislature passed the Universal Recycling Law in 2012, Vermont received national attention for its ambitious plan to increase recycling and ban compost from landfills. The law rolls out in phases, and trash haulers were supposed to be required to pick up food scraps from in front of people's homes in 2018. But Essex Orleans Senator John Rogers says trash haulers in places like the Northeast Kingdom can afford to run trucks up and down the isolated roads in rural Vermont to pick up buckets of compost. Rogers sponsored a bill that would have relieved that requirement entirely. But Rogers says the final bill only puts off the deadline until 2020, when the real solution would be not forcing the haulers to pick up compost at all. It only ended up giving the haulers a two-year extension on the food waste organics pickup, but it's better than not having anything in place. The new law directs the Agency of Natural Resources to put together a population study to see if it makes more sense to only require haulers in densely populated areas to pick up food scraps from residential homes. Kathy Jameson is head of the Solid Waste Management Program, and she says this new rule will give the state a chance to look at the universal recycling law to see if it does make sense to ask haulers to pick up food waste. The agency understood the haulers position as far as residential collection of food scraps could be challenging especially in the less densely populated areas and the, what the bill did do is direct the agency to have discussions regarding whether and how haulers should be providing the collection services for food scraps. Jameson says a lot of people in rural areas compost their own food scraps, and most of the solid waste districts have compost drop-off areas. She says food waste will be entirely banned from landfills in 2020, and if haulers in rural areas don't pick up food scraps, the state will have to come up with a plan. The agency's report to the legislature is due before next January. For VPR News, I'm Howard Weiss Tisman. Here we go. So the, um, the law, as I said earlier, bans the disposal of the baseline recyclables, and that happened in 2015. And so the baseline recyclables include the statewide six. Paper, which are your mail, magazines, newspaper, office paper, paper bags, and box board. Cardboard. Aluminum, cans, foil, and pie tins. Steel cans, glass bottles and jars, and hard plastic bottles and containers, just numbers one and number two. And again, they could be mixed, right? You can have your paper and cardboard, or you can mix it all into single stream pickup, or source separate it, um, or dual stream pickup, but these are the statewide six. And then as the second part to it, uh, they, you know, as I said, banned the leaf yard clean wood debris in 2016. 
And the food scraps um, happened in phases, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, and they culminate in the full ban in 2020 that you heard discussed in the radio clip. And so with our compost, our food scraps, uh, the law requires the transfer stations and haulers that collect trash to also offer collection services for the baseline recyclables, for leaf and yard debris, and food scraps. Haulers and facilities can charge for these services, but the purpose is to make recycling and composting as easy and convenient as trash disposal. And so here you'll see that the food scraps uh, also include meats and bones, oils, sauces, eggs. Those are things you would not be putting in your backyard bin, but with the residential pickup, they can be recycled or composted at a commercial facility. And then the trash items that are left over, your napkins and tissues, paper cups, stirrers, bottle caps, plastic bags, film, candy wrappers, and styrofoam, all kinds. And also trying to promote this when in doubt, just throw it out. It's better than trashing the recycling bin. The pay as you throw uh, which was also mentioned, requires that the residential trash costs to be charged using pay-as-you-throw pricing. So residents must be charged using volume or weight-based pricing, pricing, such as paying by the bag, by the cart, or dumpster, or by the pound. It's like paying for gas by the gallon. This incentivizes recycling and composting, resulting in less trash disposal. Um, and you know many towns have probably been doing this on their own uh, but this now because of the universal recycling law is a statewide mandate a little bit about pay as you throw um, you, sometimes it's called the variable rate pricing uh, unit based pricing is the most common volume of weight and smart save money and reduce trash is another term the uh, common UBP systems would be imprinted trash bags that you would buy at a, a local store or at the transfer station, um, stickers, punch cards, maybe containers or cans. Sometimes it's a hybrid system which means that they might use stickers as well as imprinted trash bags um, or garbage just by the pound. Uh, and again these are the financial incentive opportunities for those who follow Act 148. What is not unit-based pricing? A flat fee for trash collection services, either through town property taxes or through a private contractor that permits numerous bags, cans, bins, or containers of trash on collection day with no additional fee. A dump sticker that allows as much trash as a car or truck will hold at the dump or drop-off facility is not considered unit-based pricing. And a punch card that allows a user an unlimited amount of trash disposal for one punch of the card is also not unit-based pricing. So that means, um, like in my town, I can buy a punch card uh, for $40, but it's considered $2 a bag, and that's just so I don't always have to be writing a check. When I, you know, a $2 check each time I have to go dispose of my waste, and so I have a punch card, I purchase it for the $40, and then each time I go, it's a $2 punch, depending on how many bags I have. So the requirements for the town and your town, Vermont town, is that um, you must implement a unit-based pricing system by weight or volume, ensure that all haulers and drop-off facilities are using some type of unit-based pricing. It can vary depending upon the dynamics and specific needs of the municipality. And then again, your SWIP, the very important solid waste implementation plan, you describe your UBP system or program, including how haulers and facilities have been brought into compliance and copies of any ordinance passed. If you need any help designing a pay-as-you-throw system, uh, here's some sources for you. EPA has some wonderful tools on that. Uh, Vermont a &R has a guide, the Variable Rate Pricing Guide Ordinance. And then uh, we here at the Northeast Resource Recovery Association could help you as well in figuring out a system that would work for your town. Also, what Act 148 does 
is it requires the publicly owned buildings and spaces such as your state buildings and your parks, schools, town offices, and town parks to offer a recycling container next to every trash container. The objectives of the universal law are shown here. Expand education and outreach to schools, businesses, and the general public. Extend producer responsibility and product stewardship. Reduce the statewide disposal rate, pounds per person per year. Increase reuse, recycling, and composting of materials. Reduce the toxicity in the waste stream. Improve availability of statewide infrastructure and services for waste reduction and diversion, so striving for convenient, consistent, and cost-effective services and improve the measurement and progress of performance standards and develop sustainable financial structures to manage the materials. So in 2012, when Act 148 was passed, these are all the objectives that the state has for this universal recycling law. And as we've discussed up to this point, all the work that they're doing to meet these objectives. In order to educate outreach the schools and businesses. They have created lots, lots and lots of um, available information. They have the universal logos that are available nationwide. Uh, these logos you see here are trash, recycling, food scraps, and they also created a fourth which is an apple with a purple background and that's for food donation. Um, they have developed many brief but concise fact sheets regarding the overall universal recycling law, steps and tips for each category and sector. Um, for example, when they were doing their business outreach, they developed this poster and circulated it to the municipal buildings and businesses in Vermont. They've also um, have the phase in requirements, so they built up their staff, stakeholder relations, outreach efforts, and education material. Basically, they required what many municipalities were already doing. Um, in a sense, picking the low-hanging fruit, redefining the solid waste management to materials management, and understanding the status of solid waste entities and municipalities through the updated SWIPs. So first state in the nation to pass such a comprehensive legislation on resource management. I mentioned earlier, since 2001, their recycling rate was just 35%. People are throwing away organics, two-thirds the total of Vermont waste, even though everyone's backyard composting is still not enough and then they phased in the landfill bans. So as you see July 1st 2015 when this took effect it really was what people were already doing. Folks already had pay as you throw. They were already collecting leaf and yard waste. They were already collecting regulated waste. Most often they were doing the two HHW collections because that was already required and a list of commercial haulers which they would have to have anyways as they were filling out their solid waste implementation plan. By July 1st, 2016, that's when the state decided to start really looking at um, increasing what was the norm, uh, what was already happening. They remained with in 2015, but in 2016, like I said, they started sort of easing in the heavy hitters, really increasing uh, the yard, yard waste um, by including clean wood recycling, because many people are already collecting leaf and yard waste or recycling it, not throwing it away. But the clean wood recycling, that, a lot of that stuff was still going into the trash, and so they wanted to add that. Everyone's been collecting the regulated waste, that's your universal waste, but then they started including one more HHW collection. So rather than two, now there had to be three. And as you can see through these blocks, there's a little bit added each time. In July 1st, 2017, the facilities, municipal solid waste facilities, just your transfer stations, um, had to collect food waste, maybe that's your recycling center as well, and then still providing just three, easing into that, and then by July 2018, four HHW collections, and by the end of the term of universal waste, the material management planning term, 
in 2020, you had to establish recycling programs for asphalt, shingles, and drywall, in addition to a mandatory ban on food waste disposal. So the, they increased the HHW collections, they were fine-tuning the construction and demolition debris disposal and organics, and they were focusing on the large generators first, businesses and institutions, striving for reduction in the waste stream. In July 2016, Vermont Public Radio had this report. This is Morning Edition on Vermont Public Radio. Good morning, I'm Mitch Wertlieb. Trash haulers in Vermont must now offer collection for yard and leaf debris. And that's just another of the new requirements to come out of Vermont's universal recycling law that kicked in on July 1st. The law was passed in 2012 and requirements have been slowly phased in ever since. Here for an update on the law's effectiveness is Josh Kelly, Materials Management Chief for the Department of Environmental Conservation. And Josh, thanks very much for being with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks, Mitch. Now, the law has banned recyclable materials from landfills for over a year now. What does the data tell us, if anything, about the effectiveness of the law so far? Our most recent information is showing a statewide decrease in trash of 5% statewide. So that's that's a significant drop. Um, typically, that type of a, of a fall in trash is something we've often seen associated with our, you know, our 2008 recession, for example. Um, so to have that happen at a time when we're not in recession is, uh, is really remarkable, showing that people are recycling and that, and that the law is working. Did that exceed your expectations? I think so. I think we weren't really sure. We, we knew that many people were already on board with recycling, so having it be a requirement didn't seem like maybe all that new. But you know, if you take the Northeast Kingdom, for example, they have a, a small facility where recyclables come in from towns around the region. And in those first three months, they had a 25% jump in recycling tonnage. So there, there were places where there, there hadn't been as much services and there hadn't been maybe as much participation in recycling historically. So we've seen that in some of the more rural regions of the state where it's really galvanized. So I mentioned in the lead that there's a ban on leaf and yard debris and landfills being phased in. How is the collection for those things going to work? clean wood too and, and clean wood is your your you know limbs or logs and and clean dimensional lumber um, those are banned from disposal um, and the haulers of trash and the transfer stations where you can take trash are required to offer just leaf and yard collection so for the most part Vermonters are already managing their leaves in a way, you know, they make a leaf pile in the fall, the kids jump in it, and then they rake it off into the woods. Um, I know that very well. Yeah. Not many people are, are bagging these leaves up and paying money to throw them out. It's not, it's not something we've found um, as a high percentage. We, we do a waste composition study about every five years where we look at what's in the trash still. There is some leaf and yard trimmings in there, but it's not a significant portion. And many states have banned this material really just to send a message that this stuff doesn't belong in the landfill. It takes up space. It produces greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to climate change. Um, and, it, and it has more beneficial uses. In the Chittenden County area and, and even the Bennington region, there's many composters that use these leaves as a feedstock that they, they blend with the food scrap material to make a compost product that people use in their gardens. And so that's happening uh, all around the state. Also, with the new law, we're headed next towards collection of food waste. And does that mean that households that may not be used to doing so will have to compost now? The requirement to compost and separate food waste kicks in in 2020. So there is some time for that. But next summer is the requirement that transfer stations and haulers that take trash also provide collection services for food scraps. And there's a reason it's a couple of years before 2020. We really want to make sure that people have the options um, have the available services before the ban goes into effect on, on food waste. And options is a key word there. There are many people in Vermont who want to use their food scraps for their own home compost, for their own garden, and that's terrific, you know, cost-effective and sort of beneficial use because you, you basically make your own fertilizer for your vegetables. And then others want to have nothing to do with that, and that's okay. And you can bring it to a drop-off, and we're, we're looking to see that our transfer stations have these drop-off options come July 1, 2017, next summer. Um, and then there's many haulers in the state. We have about a dozen that offer food scrap collection currently. That's mainly on the commercial scale, so for restaurants, schools, hospitals, those sorts of uh, producers of food waste. And some are starting now to offer pilot services for 
residential curbside collection of food waste. Probably the most successful example of that is in Brattleboro, where they've been separating food waste at the curb and having it collected by their their contracted hauler for, I think, at least three years now. It's been so successful, they're coupled with recycling. They actually have stopped collecting trash weekly. They're now on an every-other-week trash collection service because there, frankly, just isn't as much of it. And, and that's really the whole goal here. I almost hate to ask this next question, Josh, but where does all that food waste go? I mean, do we have enough composting facilities in the state to deal with it? If everybody was to separate all at once, it could overwhelm the current capacity. And there's about 10 food scrap composters around the state. There's actually two permitted anaerobic digesters that have started taking food waste. We actually have about 17 farm digesters that take manure and and turn it into energy, and they also potentially could take food waste. The composters that are around the state cover most of the state. Does that that mean that they can handle all the material we could possibly send their way? Um, Not at this time, but we are seeing more uptick in capacity at these composting sites in terms of expanding their processing capacity. Some use fans to speed up the composting process called forced aeration. Um, And then The anaerobic digesters, as I mentioned, are starting to take more and more of this material. Vermont Tech has a digester at their Randolph campus. So it's changing kind of month to month. The overall goal of this law is to reduce the recyclable matter and compostable organics, um, to conserve landfill waste. And I'm just wondering if you think we're on our way to meeting the goal. I think we're off to a really great start. I think this is this is significant change. This is the biggest thing to happen to solid waste since uh, the late 80s when Act 78 came into play and all those those town dumps that were unlined were required to start having, you know, liners to be to really prevent leaching of toxic uh, chemicals into the environment. And that made a lot of change for a lot of towns. We ju- we just weren't burying our trash in unsanitary ways anymore. And so that change took a long time to take effect. And now we're, we're at the next phase where we're managing our waste better when we have landfill. It certainly we have much, much more well-designed landfills. And no one wants to have a new landfill. We want to preserve that space as much as possible. So with the decrease in trash we've seen, the 5% uh, decrease, and the uptick in recycling, we're at 35% currently, up from 33%. We're really seeing the law working. In addition to that, the food donation story has been just tremendous. The food bank has seen, I think, a 30% increase in food donation recently. They expect more coming up. These are all great outcomes that in some ways we, we couldn't have even anticipated. We're, we're very optimistic going ahead with the, the next phases of the law and, and really trying to get out there to help people find services and figure out ways of making it work for them. Josh Kelly is Materials Management Chief for the Department of Environmental Conservation. Thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Thanks again, Mitch. So, very, very, very promising. As of 2016, a little bit of a hiccup here in 2018, but the state is really, really trying to work through the barriers and um, some of these barriers were, one, the assumption that separation or composting will be dirty or produce odors. Another one is that the infrastructure concerns, which you heard Josh speak about, the number of facilities and haulers offering the collection service, and then the cost for collection and the time to source separate um, is a concern. And so as this has been phased in, the reason for phasing it in, the reason for providing flexibility, Um, is to take care of these barriers and to try to break the barriers. And so as uh, the state is breaking the barriers, they have created and come to a few solutions. Uh, They want to dispel the myth about separation and composting being unsanitary. They're using education and outreach about home composting. Use well-managed hauling services that will mitigate odor. Uh, the projected need for off-site organics processing is estimated to be, and this was in 2017, 43,662 tons per year. That number has sort of been tossed around a little bit. A few different numbers have come up over the time. But as you heard Josh say, say that the projected current processing capacity via the existing composting facilities is approximately 22 to 35,000 tons a year. So definitely the need is to have more facilities out there, composting facilities, um, or expand the ones that are there. 
And the businesses will be able to reduce the trash cost by diverting recover food to feed hungry people. Again, Josh had mentioned how successful the food bank program was. Um, a 40% increase when this whole thing just started kicking off and they started working with the larger generators with their food waste and sending it to the um, food shelves and community kitchens um, and anywhere that people are donating foods, um, feeding the hungry. So haulers are charged a tipping fee for the weight of landfill bound waste. That's the pay as you throw. If organics are removed from customers trash, the haulers have a significant weight savings and this means savings for them and their customers. You heard Josh again speak about all that A&R AR is doing to get it done. They're uh, trying to develop the infrastructure. They're educating the public. They're finding funding. They're developing annual reporting forms for solid waste management enterprises. And they're developing a geographic information system library where they're mapping the central collection sites, generators, material recovery facilities, and disposal sites. Uh, for an example, A&R's MM key pledge regarding organics. They will collaborate with other groups and agencies to develop a waste reduction program for schools. They will educate and inform the commercial sector and the general public about the benefits of reducing food waste. They will promote statewide the accepted compost practices um, developed in collaboration with compost professionals. They will promote source reduction, such as EPA's Food Too Good to Waste pilot program, as well as the Food Rescue and Donation programs. They will encourage all government sectors to establish a voluntary sustainable or sustainability or green team to educate the staff and encourage diversion of organics. They will divert all organics from the waste stream in the state and local government buildings by the end of the planned term. They will encourage state agencies to use compost produced in Vermont in landscaping applications such as grounds, road, easements, and medians. They will develop a web-based interactive map of food scrap generators and certified facilities. And will conduct outreach to a wide array of organic stakeholders and develop partnerships and connections with organizations to support the implementation of the new law. And so this is a list of what they are doing just to address the organics, which we had mentioned was uh, the more difficult, right? This, is, this was their pledge, their material management pledge for organics. And um, as stated earlier, the pay as you throw, the recycling, all that was already in place. It really was the organics that could be the biggest hiccup as we see is, is happening, but working through it. Let's take a moment and recap the benefits of the Universal Recycling Law. It saves valuable resources and promotes sustainability, reduces greenhouse gas emissions by an estimated 37% by 2022, supports green jobs, creating new markets and business opportunities, reduces need for landfills, improving the health of our environment. Vermont's Universal Recycling Law has shifted the focus from feeding landfills to feeding hungry Vermonters. What is not donated can be fed to animals, composted, or used to create renewable energy and anaerobic digesters. And that is a quote from Alyssa B. Shoren, DEC Commissioner. And I'd also like to take a moment and just point out that food waste is not just a Vermont issue. It is a global issue. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, a third of all food produced for human consumption is wasted annually at a cost of some 680 billion in developed countries. That's billion dollars. The food wasted in Europe alone could feed 200 million people. In the U.S., roughly 40% of the food produced never reaches the table. That's 40% of the food produced, which equals 365 million pounds a day, never reaches the table. And yet over 40 million Americans live in food insecure households, with more than one in five children being at risk of hunger. For Latin American and African American communities, this number may be as high as one in three. Every year, 3.1 million children under five die from poor nutrition. 
while hunger is a problem that's hard to fix, we owe it to those who are starving to respect the food that we have access to. The focus on organics. Vermonters have been recycling for decades, but you know, probably since the 70s or 80s in many communities. But the universal recycling law makes it the new normal. Thus, residents across Vermont now have more recycling options, including the curbside services, making it easier than ever to do the right thing. So 2017, the companies are offering trash pickup, will be required to offer the food waste collection. Again, though, that was changed to 2018, and then it was delayed for another two years. So the residents will place the food waste in a separate bin when it does finally come around to being implemented. But 2020, all food waste banned from disposal is still in play. So still working to get, get it under control in the next two years. And let's just take a moment and define what the organics are. So the organics refer to material derived from living organisms. So while recycling is well established, it is estimated that the organic materials, the food scraps, leaf and yard debris, clean wood, and compostable dirty paper make up almost a third of our waste. So they're the largest single component of the total MSW stream in the United States make up about 40% of the MSW discarded after diversion through recycling and composting, and they are the majority of the greenhouse gas emissions in landfills are from the organics. And um, just to make a note that the material management plan, biosolids and septage are discussed separately from other organic materials. Animal waste is not a subject addressed in Vermont's MMP. Nearly 100,000 tons of organic material is estimated to be landfilled every year. As organic material decomposes in a landfill, it produces methane gas, a greenhouse gas that is 20 times more damaging than carbon dioxide. So for this reason, we need to focus on organics to find that higher and better uses for this material and prevent its contribution to climate change. In fact, the US EPA and USDA have both recently joined together calling for a 50% reduction in food waste by 2030. So Vermont is not alone. With the passage of Vermont's universal recycling law, we have joined the states of Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and California to shift the focus from feeding landfills to feeding people, feeding animals, creating soil amendments like compost, and creating renewable energy through anaerobic digestion technology. The 2012 Universal Recycling Law also set forth a hierarchy of beneficial uses for organics. And uh, this is what this is, the Vermont Food Recovery Hierarchy, which is similar to EPA's. So source reduction means smart buying and procurement to reduce spoiling. Food for people, donate quality edible food for people in need and stop wasting food. Food for animals, livestock feed, such as brewery grains and other foods. Compost and digestion. People can compost at home or at a composting facility. Vermont farm digesters also accept some food residuals. And then energy recovery refers to the woody organic materials used for biomass fuel. So the organics mandates and disposal ban, they were phased in as well. Like everything else has been phased in in the universal law. The um, Vermont Act 148 required a larger food scrap generator to divert food scraps according to the food residuals management hierarchy if a certified facility is within 20 miles, phased over time by the size of the generator. Uh, in July 1st, 2014, they hit the generators of more than 104 tons per year. The next year, it was 52 tons. The next year, 26 tons. And then for generators of more than 18 tons, July 1st, 2017. So this uh, is all about generators, not about the residents that we've been hearing about, how that was just sort of a little blip that needs to continue to be worked out. So while a business or person that produces food waste is not required to strictly follow the order of the hierarchy, such as feed animals before they compost the material, the hierarchy reminds us of the highest and best priority uses for this material. 
Um, in December 2016, progress report, the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation reported that their food scrap uh, mandate and disposal ban and how it's been phased in has, um, we have 10 certified composting or anaerobic digestion facilities, 13 permitted food scrap haulers, 17 farm digesters, many already taking food processing residuals, one hun hundreds, hundreds of businesses, schools, and institutions were composting even before the law went into effect. And then DEC confirmed that the largest food waste producers located within 20 miles of an organic facility are separating food scraps as required by the Universal Recycling Law. And again, that was uh, from the 2016 December progress report. And I just want to share here a few pictures of one of the composting businesses that are very active and helping with making this universal law work, uh, especially with those large generators, right? So it's TAM Composting in Shaftesbury, Vermont. There's food coming from a supermarket, one of the larger generators, and then the full-size rendering of it. And then here's a picture of the windrow, the method that they use, and then once they screen it, the end product. Let's just summarize everything that we have learned up to this point, how the Vermont Universal Recycling Law is working. You heard from Josh Kelly of ANR that in uh, 2016, that's what the radio clip was from when he was interviewed by VPR, that there was a 5% decrease in trash disposal. We also know that there is a 2% increase in the recycling and composting those first couple of years. The food donation was a big win, nearly 40%. Um, increase and that was according to the Vermont Food Bank and that really has to do with the fact that the larger food waste generators the grocery stores the institutions hospitals probably correctional facilities restaurants schools they were targeted at the very beginning to try to reduce their waste food waste and so all of that ended up going to our, our donations to feed the people which we saw was a part of the food hierarchy. And then more Vermonters have access to recycling collection than ever before, again, because of the mandate. Recyclables are finally banned from being landfilled and the haulers are required to pick up all the recyclables. And so after decades of landfilling more than two thirds of Vermont's materials, it is appropriate to shift our focus to recycling food donation and composting and that is a quote from Kathy Jamison solid waste program manager in 2016 let's hear what is happening now in 2018 This is Vermont Edition. I'm Rick Singeri, and for Jane Lindholm. Coventry, Vermont. For many fish fans, the town has special meaning. It was the site of what was to be the band's final live performance. If you know where to look in the town, you might still find the palm trees in the stage that graced the swampy venue that weekend in 2004. Coventry is also the site of the Newport State Airport. That was the cornerstone of the plans Bill Stenger and Ariel Kiros had before the EB-5 scandal scuppered those plans. And it's also the home of the state's landfill, and that's why we're so interested in Coventry today. We'll take a look at what you should be doing with your trash, where it goes, and why the state wants to expand the landfill in Coventry. In 2015, Jane Lindholm got to tour the facility with Joe Gay, an engineer with Casella Waste Systems, which owns and operates the landfill. And at the time, Gay had grave concerns about how vigilantly Vermonters were recycling. There's far too much recycling still as we look at the trash coming out of the trucks today. There is way too much recycling that's still coming to this facility needlessly. Uh, we've got to do a better job as Vermonters 
um, removing the cardboard and removing the plastic bottles and removing the plastics um, and getting those materials into the waste stream. So is it frustrating to you to look down and see so much recyclable material still in the landfill? It's very frustrating, absolutely. When, when you walk out there, it's, it's almost shameful um, with the amount of materials that can be going to better uses than uh, being disposed of here at the site. That's Joe Gay, an engineer with Casella Waste Systems at the Coventry Landfill in the Northeast Kingdom. And joining me to discuss the state of trash in the state is Kathy Jamison, Solid Waste Program Manager at the Agency of Natural Resources. Kathy, welcome back to Vermont Edition. Well, thank you for having us. All right, Kathy, let's follow the trash in Vermont. Of all the trash we create, how much goes to a landfill, how much gets diverted? Um, well, in, in general terms, we uh, dispose of two-thirds of the trash that we generate, and we recycle about one-third. Um, so those are in rough terms. Um, we generate or dispose of about um, uh, 500,000 tons of trash a year, and that's Vermont-generated materials. Gotcha. And what rules are in place today that Vermonters should be following with their trash? Um, so there's um, rules and incentives that we have, multiple programs. Um, probably, hopefully, most people have heard of the Universal Recycling Program. And what prompted the passage of that program in 2012 was that we were pretty stagnant at our recycling rate. We've been trying to recycle more, but over the decades, we only got to about 30, 32 percent recycling. And so um, what's targeted in that law are recyclables and organics. Organics meaning clean wood, leaf and yard debris, and food scraps. And so there's um, a number of provisions in the law to provide incentives and convenience for people so that hopefully it'll be easier uh, for folks to uh, recycle the recyclable material and then put the organics to better use. We have a food rescue program with the food bank is um, really doing a great work with using and reaching out to grocery stores and, and diverting or you, that edible food that had been disposed to those in need. Um, and then we go down the, the chain as far as using organics for, um, you know, either feeding animals or, or going to composting facilities or anaerobic digestion. So those materials are better used than just going to the landfill and perhaps generating methane. And have we moved that number up from about 30, 32 percent? Well, um, this is a story of, you know, one step forward and maybe two steps back in that um, when we look at these initiatives and recycling was mandated to no longer be thrown away in 2015 and then leaf and yard in 2016 and then phased in over time as a food scrap so that by 2020, everyone should not be throwing away the food scraps. The larger generators were targeted earlier. So when we look at 2015, we actually decreased, uh, thanks to all the good work of Vermonters, um, 5% of what we were throwing away. We were throwing away 5% less when we compared it to th 2014. Likewise, in 2016, we were throwing away about three and a half percent less in addition to that five percent. So that's, yeah, we're going in the right direction. Unfortunately, and we're still double checking um, the data, but it looks like we slipped in 2017. So we actually increased the amount of waste that we're throwing away even above the 2014 amount. Hmm. So we're going to look at that data carefully to see is there a particular part of the waste stream we should be targeting? Um, how can we get back to the path that we were on? Of the trash that heads to a landfill, how much does wind up in Coventry? How much goes out of state? Um, great question. And so in Vermont, we actually export and send out of state uh, more trash than we bring into state. Um, and when you look at Vermont, the southern part of the state is pretty far from Coventry. Coventry is near the Canadian border. Um, so um, that waste is going to, out of state um, mostly to New Hampshire or New York. Um, and so 25% of, of the waste, the trash that's generated by um, homes and businesses is going out of state. If we look at um, the export-import um, comparison, um, we brought in 50,000 tons more in 2016 than we shipped out. Um, and, and then also in 2017, it was closer, so it was about 7,000 tons difference that we shipped out more than brought in. I think the distinction, though, is that uh, what's being brought in is not trash from residents and businesses. It's more of what we call um, uniform waste or special waste. 
Is there any other facility other than Coventry, even a small landfill, that ex- accepts trash in the state? There's one small. Okay, so that sudden cut is not a technical error. I did that on purpose because the interview is quite lengthy. It's about 30 minutes. But if it did catch your interest and you want to hear it in its entirety, you can click on the link here. It's the third bullet down. Coventry Landfill Expansion Plan draws attention. And the other two that we played in this webinar that are um, both in their entirety, that is the fifth one down, trash down 5%, and the sixth one down, legislative delays, curbside food scraps. And then as you can see, there are a few other interviews regarding the progress of the universal recycling law and just the general scenario of solid waste management in the state of Vermont. For more resources on Act 148, we have the Vermont Universal Recycling Law, the Status Report, December 2016. A lot of this webinar, uh, the information came from that report, as well as you heard a lot about it with the uh, interviews on Vermont Public Radio. There's also the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources website, and that has lots of information about Act 148, summary of the law, fact sheets, and many additional resources. And then if you're interested in using the universal recycling symbols, that link is right there as well. And go ahead, use them for your marketing needs. And then a system analysis of the impact of Act 148 on solid waste management in Vermont. This report was done prior to the law being implemented. So it was in 2013. Um, They did the work a year before 2012 when the legislation passed and before they started implementing everything in 2015. So if you're interested in the history of it, the data that was collected that helped make the decision to move forward with Universal Recycling Law, Act 148, that report may interest you. We are now concluding and want to thank TAM Waste Management for allowing us to use their images as well as the Agency of Natural Resources uh, for permitting us to use their images, as well as to uh, utilize all the reports and documents that they've put out for us to be able to do a comprehensive training of Act 148. And then the permission to copy any is available for reproduction by permission only. And um, yeah, please, uh, Please take advantage of the other webinars that we have available. And if you would like to contact us, here's our contact information. And again, thank you so much for taking time. And please, to get your professional development credits or CEUs, you will need to fill out the survey, the 10-question survey, pass it, we, we grade it and then we will send you your certificate of completion. If you're not looking for getting your credits, we still will be sending you a survey. It's not as many questions, it's not as detailed because it's not like we're trying to test you on what did you learn in this module, but we just really want to hear your opinion of our training modules. So thank you so much again. Enjoy your day.